Good afternoon. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, my name is Harun Mogul. I'm a fellow in the National Security Studies Program here at New America. Uh, today's panel is titled, what do, we, what do We Make of Extremism After Wisconsin? Uh, I wanted to very briefly introduce the topic, and then uh, I'll let the speakers uh, go at it. Uh, they'll each have about 10 minutes of comments, and then uh, I'll invite your participation for questions. Uh, please feel free to ask any uh, and all questions. We're trying to make this as interactive as possible. Uh, the idea for the event uh, essentially comes after the August 5th attack uh, on a Sikh Gurdwara, a Sikh temple in Wisconsin, uh, and the day after uh, an attack, uh, apparent arson at a mosque in Missouri, Joplin, Missouri. Um, these are part of a larger pattern of attacks against immigrants, uh, minorities, uh, Muslim Sikhs, uh, populations that are often sometimes confused, and an attempt to better understand uh, what's going on in the 2012 election season uh, and the effect potentially uh, of a bad economy uh, and of some of the anti-Muslim, anti-immigrant rhetoric that's out there, but I will let the uh, panelists elaborate on that themselves. Uh, to my right, we have Spencer Ackerman, who's a senior reporter for Wired. Uh, hopefully you've read his stuff. He's got some very interesting stuff out there coming out regularly. Um, uh, here we have Amandeep Sidhu, uh, who is from the co-founder of the Sikh Coalition. He's an attorney at McDermott uh, and works with the Interfaith Alliance. Uh, we were going to have Valerie Kaur come in to speak. Uh, unfortunately, uh, she is actually in Wisconsin. It was sort of a last-minute change of plans. Um, but Amandeep has graciously uh, taken uh, some of his time to come here and talk to us. And then all the way at the end, we have Harris Thurin, uh, who is the director of the Washington, D.C. Office of MPAC, the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Um, so I'll start with Spencer, if that's OK, uh, and then we'll move on this way. Um, and uh, then we'll have time for questions. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks to Haroon for holding this. Thanks to New America for hosting this. Uh, thanks to my fellow panelists for putting up with me on this. Um, I wanted to make a couple quick points kind of running down a bit of the, the landscape of uh, domestic uh, extremism. Um, this is usually something that, as you all know, gets discussed uh, in terms of uh, a jihadist threat, a threat from Al-Qaeda, a threat from uh, homegrown uh, Islamic extremism. Um, what we've sort of built since 9-11 is an apparatus of surveillance uh, and of detention under the rubric of terrorism that, in practice, is focused uh, very heavily on Muslims. and. Uh, where this has led has, has been a variety of, 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 of different cases. Um, it's hard to really quantify hard numbers when you look at uh, terrorism arrests uh, related to um, Islamic extremism uh, after 9-11. Um, you do have uh, a kind of gradation. You, you have gradations in, in, in the severity of the threats here. You have uh, a large population uh, arrested and convicted on things like uh, financial support, usually for groups like Hamas, sometimes for Hezbollah, um, very, very few uh, for al-Qaeda, um, and very rarely do you have circumstances, although this has ticked up in recent years, um, for homegrown uh, Americans who either self-radicalize and join al-Qaeda or seek to sort of promote its agenda. It's out there, but it's statistically rather small. Um, inside the populace, uh, the cohort that I've mentioned, um, you've got uh, a significant but still small uh, group of people who have con been convicted of violent acts or of conspiracy to commit violent acts. And, and the point that I'm driving at here is that in this cohort, which is already very, very small compared to the broader population of American Muslims, um, an even still smaller cohort of people who have been convicted of violent activities. That's not to say they weren't plotting violent activities. It is to say that this is um, small even within the small cohort of those who have been uh, correctly surveilled, apprehended, uh, arrested, and convicted. Um, and yet, when you see the discourse uh, in this country uh, about terrorism, uh, there's almost a presumption of guilt on the part of, of the entire Muslim population. Um, and this has found a way over the course of this, uh, what you might call the 9-11 decade, um, of infecting, I would use that word, uh, the institutions of national security that are supposed to safeguard um, the, the security as well as, as the rights and liberties of the American people. I did a series last year where I found uh, 
what PowerPoints and, and presentations to the FBI uh, training academy at Quantico delivered to third and uh, second and, and uh, third uh, year experienced counterterrorism agents uh, that that found that they were being taught uh, that all Muslims are violent, that mainstream Muslims are violent, that Al Qaeda was a distraction from the actual threat of Islam itself, and and it became sort of baffling at first to understand how it was that uh, the nation's premier law enforcement agency, which is supposed to protect us from this very specific threat, had come to accept implicitly and host uh, this, this overbroad conception of a threat that treated a significant population of American citizens not as people who are entitled to rights under the Constitution that their government is supposed to safeguard for them, but threats to that very apparatus. Um, and we see some of the wages of this. I'll, I'll take two examples really quick that were in the news fairly recently. Um, it came out in testimony uh, in, on Monday uh, that the NYPD, which is built, I'm a New Yorker, I, I have uh, both some experience with with the NYPD um, as as a recipient of its services and and also sort of sort of seeing the way it actually polices uh, New York City. Uh, it built an uh, elaborate system of surveillance that was not tethered to suspicion of and certainly commission of a crime. It was built around the idea that uh, in order to get uh, tips to to understand what was actually happening in cohorts uh, in New York City that, that they considered to be uh, possible incubators of terrorism, which is to say uh, American Muslim communities, one of which on Coney Island Avenue in Flatbush is right by where I grew up. Um, they would go into mosques, they would find informers, they would uh, track patterns of life of, of legitimate business people. Um, and there was a great deal of concern when, when this started to get reported on, do some great reporting from the Associated Press, that, you know, you would see a lot of hand-wringing stories and editorials about this, that uh, perhaps this has, uh, even, even among people who, who I, would, I would say do not have a particular animus against American Muslims, they would say, well, uh, perhaps this is overbroad, but isn't there, you know, a legitimate threat that people have to, have to uh, look out for, and doesn't that justify uh, these perhaps extraordinary police powers? And what we found from open testimony on Monday is that not a single lead in the six years of this surveillance program has been generated from this enhanced surveillance. That six years have gone by, not a single terrorism investigation has been launched because of it, let alone yielding a conviction. So if you've got to put together a kind of cost-benefit analysis of, of how something that has a very uh, quantifiable, measurable, understandable, and intuitively uh, kind of disturbing impact on American citizens and American nationals, that is to say they are surveilled by, by a law enforcement agency, versus the benefits to national security. If you were to take it purely on that cost-benefit calculus, it's hard to see how you could make a case for this going on. And yet this is six years that, that this program has existed. Um, it had been... Um, at least one year that uh, an individual responsible for this FBI training that uh, that uh, I had found had been had been um, engaged in similar activity. Um, websites inside the FBI's intranet had been set up for uh, disseminating uh, rather uh, curious, obscure, and somewhat um, misleading information about about Islam within the FBI's own own uh, online system so that, you know, responsible agents, responsible counterterrorism agents who are seeking to get a little bit of background on, on the cases that they'd be seeking together would find uh, information about the perfidies of Islam itself. Um, and the, the thing that this is kind of needing up to is, 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 is a, a question for our society as a whole, which is at what point is this enough? At what point do we say that uh, exceptional uh, law enforcement surveillance and, um, and, and, and security powers given to the government to protect uh, the citizens of the United States from an extreme circumstance that is the, the threat of, of al-Qaeda have become simply a regularized aspect of, of the American national security state and is there a constituency for rolling it back? What we've now seen, and, and this will be the, the point I'd, I'd, I'd like to very much uh, hear my colleagues on the, on the panel um, discuss, We've now seen incidences of violence against uh, the Sikh community. Um, we've seen incidences of uh, white supremacist violence um, that we ought to forthrightly call terrorism. It is uh, the 
I think it's fair to conclude, uh, violence toward a political goal, um, and that is the pretty standard non-controversial, you know, non-religious specific definition of terrorism. Um, I interviewed a, a Department of Homeland Security analyst who, who found himself in trouble in 2009 for writing a paper about uh, the rise of right-wing extremism. Um, he was uh, denounced uh, in, the, in the media, often by conservatives, um, for uh, issuing this overbroad warning about uh, right-wing violence. And conservatives were very worried that this meant that a new democratic administration would start taking uh, the extraordinary powers of the American national security state and use it against uh, people who had done nothing more than uh, express their, their rights to be conservative, to, to espouse uh, right-wing views in this country. And I interviewed this analyst, and he told me that one of the, the most immediate consequences um, was that his bureau uh, looking at, at neo-Nazis, at white supremacists, was gutted. Um, and basically, after you know a, a platoon of around 12 analysts uh, during his time, now been reduced to one, and he's not one of them. But uh, I did have to say, and I pressed him in interviews, and um, wrote this in a story I wrote about him, uh, some of his critics had a real point. Uh, his his, uh, his uh, warning about uh, right-wing extremism went far beyond the threat of neo-Nazis, of, 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 of white supremacists. And you could see how if you were someone of a conservative political affiliation, how you might be, you know, rather worried that there would be this, this you know, atmosphere of collective suspicion that, you know, someone who, uh, you know, writes for National Review or posts to a conservative blog or maintains conservative viewpoints on Twitter or something like that might, you know, come under suspicion. And I, I think that uh, that seems rather uncontroversially un-American. Uh, problematic, overbroad, and a reasonable concern about the civil liberties of people engaging nothing more than constitutionally protected speech. And I would close by saying perhaps that same uh, tenor of understanding uh, that applied towards right-wingers, uh, we ought to similarly exercise as we judge what the state uh, is doing to American Muslims. Thank you very much. Um, Aman? Great. Thank you, Arun, and thank you to the, the New America Foundation for hosting this event. Um, the perspective that I'm going to bring is going to be one, first and foremost, uh, as a sick American, secondly, as uh, an attorney in the sick American community that's worked on, on issues of discrimination um, and bias crimes over the last decade since 9-11, um, and, and to provide some context to what led to Oak Creek and what's being done after. Oak Creek. Um, as everyone in the room is well aware, um, the tragedy that occurred at a Sikh uh, Gurdwara on October 5th uh, took the lives of six uh, individuals. It, uh, it was a, a tragic, tragic attack on, on the Sikh community, um, something that as shocked as we were as a community, as shocked as we were as a nation, uh, did not unfortunately come as, as a surprise um, because it's something that the community had feared and anticipated, not just since 9-11, but even before 9-11, um, an attack by an individual who had known ties to uh, neo-Nazi groups and, and white supremacist uh, beliefs. Um, it, the, the fear uh, that that type of attack could occur um, has existed in, in the Sikh American community and, and certainly in other minority communities for, for many years. Um, after Oak Creek, we saw widespread media attention. Um, CNN had a, a crew on the ground for the majority of that week. Um, and, and an unprecedented amount of, of attention focused on uh, a small religious minority in the United States of, of uh, close to 700,000 individuals. Um, and, and probably more attention and media coverage on the specific aspects of the Sikh faith than had occurred literally in the, in the three decades before that. So you had a community that saw this, this horrible incident and immediately looked to how it could be shifted into a positive opportunity to draw attention to the Sikh American community, the unique uh, circumstances of, of the Articles of Faith, that, uh, that six maintain, including uh, the, the turban and, and uncut hair um, and beard. And so you 
immediately had the media attention. You had uh, government responding in, in unprecedented ways, um, flags flown at half staff for the week, um, Attorney General Holder speaking at the memorial um, uh, at the end of the, the week after the attacks. The First Lady is, is on the ground in Oak Creek today meeting with uh, the victims' families um, there uh, at the Sikh Temple. Um, so you saw resilience in the community. You, you saw this, this response, which was not one of, of hunkering down uh, a chilling effect on, on the practice of, of religion, um, which is really ultimately the, the goal of, of an attacker like uh, the one in Oak Creek or similarly the, the attackers in, in recent events just in the last month on, on mosques throughout the United States. Um, so, uh, you know, we have a, a response of a community that is one of, of education, outreach, and, and really moving forward. But for all of the progress that occurred uh, since 9-11, um, specifically in the Sikh American community, the, the proliferation of national organizations like the Sikh Coalition, which was literally created uh, the, the day after 9-11, to track hate crimes, provide legal resources, and, and respond to um, the unprecedented backlash that the Sikh American community faced after 9-11. Um, despite all of that progress in the last decade, it, Oak Creek was a wake-up call that there was a tremendous amount of work that still needed to be done, and there was a, a threat um, in the form of, of, as has been you know, correctly characterized as domestic terrorism, and uh, the, the threat of hate crimes that, you know, this incident led to the, the, the deaths of, of six individuals, but in the last decade has led to the, the deaths of, of hundreds uh, and, and perhaps even thousands of, of six uh, Muslim South Asians and, and Arabs, and those perceived to be members of those communities. So I think what's important to note is, is the context. Uh, you know, we talk about Islamophobia, we talk about uh, mistaken identity and the idea that uh, this was a, an a assumed attack on, on a Muslim community, but it, it happened to be six uh, because we wore uh, we were turbans. Uh, to some extent, perhaps that's true, but but ultimately there is a, a context here, and that is one that predates 9/11. Um, it's a, an association between uh, the turban and extremism or terrorism. Um, as early as uh, the, the, the 1980s in, in my lifetime, uh, growing up in, in Virginia, you know, born and, born and raised there, uh, I experienced hate crimes, I experienced bias crimes, I experienced bigotry. Um, so this wasn't a phenomenon that, that was created on, on September 11th. It's a phenomenon that, that far predated 9-11. Uh, in fact, six have been in the, the United States for, for over a century. Um, in 1906, there's an incident uh, in Bellingham, Washington, where a community of Sikh Americans living peacefully there were literally driven out of their town by an angry mob. Um, so, you know, not an attack on, on a, an assumed uh, Muslim community, an attack on, on a Sikh community, an attack on Sikhs because they were a turban, uh, we, we look different, and an attack on otherness. Um, so looking back on, on the pre-9-11 context, uh, we have to, to think about what that means when you have an attack like what happened in, in Oak Creek. Um, so uh, you know, an attack on a minority community practicing their faith. Um, and ultimately, we have a context today where that incident, while it's been characterized as an act of domestic terrorism, will not be noted in the FBI hate crimes tracking statistics as a hate crime against the Sikh American community. It'll either be characterized as an attack against uh, the Muslim community and, and put into that bucket, um, or it would be put into the, the so-called other category, which could uh, account for any attack on any um, non-delineated um, member of a minority community um, that, that is tracked by the FBI. So after the attacks in Oak Creek, there's been a, a tremendous effort. Um, it actually preceded the attacks on Oak Creek, but has been <coughs> stepped up since, uh, since those attacks to push the FBI to actually include uh, a component that tracks hate crimes against the Sikh American community. Um, you know, the, the purpose of these tracking mechanisms is to understand the problem, allocate resources, figure out solutions. So if there isn't uh, a way to measure what's happening in a community like the Sikh American community. There's no way to actually start to solve the problem. 
Um, so part of it is an anti-Muslim sentiment and an assumption that that anyone associated with the Muslim community is uh, associated with terrorism or extremism. But part of it is is understanding that that it's an attack on on otherness in America, an attack on someone who looks different because they wear a turban or they have a beard or they have brown skin. Um, so looking at, at statistics, we don't have them from the FBI, but we have some context. Um, we have the Southern Poverty Law Center telling us that there was a, a 60 percent increase in the proliferation of, of white neo-Nazi, white supremacist neo-Nazi hate groups in the United States since uh, since 9-11. You have 2010 statistics showing that 20 percent of hate crimes uh, that have occurred have been focused on on the religious beliefs of the the victims. Um, FBI over 6,600 hate crimes uh, reported in 2010, broken down amongst the, the many communities, but no specific breakdown in the Sikh American community. Um, post 9-11, the Sikh Coalition began tracking incidents in the Sikh community. There were a, at least 300 incidents within uh, the first 90 days after 9-11. Those ranged from uh, individuals being uh, pushed, shoved, yelled at, screamed at, um, you know, physically assaulted in the street to the, the murder of Bulbir Singh Sodhi uh, a week after the 9-11 the attacks. But part of the, the problem is the underreporting of incidents in the community. So you, you have uh, similarly a, a study from the, the Bureau of Justice, Justice Statistics uh, 2005 indicating that Hate crimes are, are potentially underreported um, by a factor of 15. So if you take the, the 300 incidents that occurred in the Sikh community in those three months and multiply it by 15, you have some scope. If you take the 20% the of 6,000 anti-religious hate crimes that occurred in 2010 and, and take that up by a factor of 15, you, you see the full scope of, of the problem. Um, and and underreporting is a, an issue that is, is ultimately caused by, by multiple factors. Um, you have a uh, community, for example, the Sikh community, where law enforcement in, in the predominant home country of India is, is not trusted. And so you have uh, a lack of trust of law enforcement, a lack of understanding, a fear of, of immigration enforcement. And so you have underreporting of incidents. You have incidents that go routine and, and things that people simply accept as, as the price of being a religious minority in America. Um, on a personal note, the, the day of 9-11, I was driving home from my office. Uh, I worked in, in Alexandria. I was driving past the Pentagon. I was driven off the side of the road by an angry driver waving his hands with, with profanities. Ultimately, that, that was a hate incident. But could I report it? Did I get a license plate? No. But that's happening. And it, it happened after 9-11. It happens today. Um, I just looked at my email before I, I came in here and an incident of uh, a sick uh, business owner in New Jersey um, asking his neighboring business to move his, his tow truck so it didn't block his driveway and he was violently, brutally beaten um, by that individual and, uh, and while the, the motivation could have simply been um, uh, an anger towards that request. There's always the fear that there's some component of hate or, or bias associated with those types of attacks. Um, so, you know, providing these statistics is really to give you some context to the fact that there are a lot of incidents happening, and you know, no matter how many resources uh, the Sikh community, the Muslim community, the South Asian community have uh, within nonprofit organizations to to do this this great work. The onus is on the federal government to start tracking these incidents, to start providing resources, um, to pay attention to organizations like the Southern Poverty Law Center that have been tracking the, the Oak Creek attacker for, for over a decade, and say, we need to focus attention. We need to figure out why these incidents are occurring and where they're occurring and provide the appropriate resources to hopefully come together and, and figure out a solution. Um, specifically in the Sikh community, um, you know, part of the, the solution is drawing attention, providing education. So in addition to the, the uh, FBI tracking effort where we have 19 members of uh, the, the Senate and uh, over 90 uh, members of the House who've written a letter 
um, to the FBI indicating that this should be tracked. Uh, there's also been a call for uh, Senate hearings on the issue of hate crimes um, and, and bias incidents in, in the United States uh, in the wake of Oak Creek and the attacks on um, the mosques uh, across the Southeast United States. Uh, 150 organizations are signed on. Many of those individuals uh, representing their organizations are in the room today. Um, there's no question that there's a call for something to be done. Um, and, and moving forward, you know, we, uh, the sick American community, we, we see that, you know, being in places of employment, breaking down barriers, um, six in law enforcement, six in uh, the U.S. military, um, having the visibility of uh, a minority with a turban, with a beard, um, in the context of being the average American, um, th there's nothing more American than serving your country in the armed forces, and so we're very proud to have obtained the accommodation of, of three sick Americans to serve in the U.S. Army in the last two years. And that sends a strong message, but it, you can see with Oak Creek the challenge we're up against. Uh, we're, we're never going to educate the attacker in, in Oak Creek about um, who the sick American community is, why we wear a turban, and, and why we're, we, we are Americans. But we can do a better job as a country of, of tracking those incidents and, and providing resources to those communities to protect themselves. So I welcome everyone's questions after the, the panel. Thank you, Alman. Horace? Thank you. Thank you, Harun, and to the New America Foundation for hosting this, this conversation. Um, I don't think this conversation takes place enough, um, and I think uh, as Aman mentioned, uh, there are folks who are doing this great work, tracking this great work, but um, but not enough people are hearing about uh, this conversation on extremism. And, and violence, and I think what I want to focus on is looking at violence and its correlation to political extremism. Uh, I think we are going through a, a very specific period in our country where political extremism um, has been mainstreamed to a certain extent. And we see, these, uh, we see this in all issues, not just on issues of religious or minorities or minorities in general, but we see this in the news, we see this in the media, and we see this in, in the halls of Congress, unfortunately. So what I want to focus on a little bit is, um, is the fact that this, the, the hate crimes that are taking place, the violence that's taking place, this is not occurring in a vacuum. There's been, um, over the past decade, since the 9-11 kind of 9 11 decade that we're talking about, there has been very deliberate uh, mechanisms and institutions and processes put in place by individuals, foundations, and groups that have created this environment, this environment of fear, of hate, which, which then translates into violence. And not many people are willing to say that and are willing to go far enough, uh, but that is, when, when political extremism becomes mainstreamed, people then take it to the next level. And, and uh, political rhetoric does not fall on deaf ears. I mean, that's, that is something that we see that uh, groups like the ACLU has seen, that uh, groups like the Sub Southern Poverty Law Center has seen. And I'll go into those numbers a little bit later. But just to kind of give, give everybody a little bit of a background in terms of when this political extremism became mainstreamed as it pertains to the American Muslim community. We saw in the midterm elections of 2006, the first kind of proliferation of a national conversation about Muslims and the marginalization and, and, and making the Mus American Muslim community into a fifth column. And we saw local candidates at the, at the very local level, not just at the federal level, um, seeing this as a potential uh, election winning strategy. Um, so there corresponded uh, bashing Muslims, anti-Muslim rhetoric um, to gaining votes and to and tying it to national security. So anti-Muslim rhetoric and national security became part of the same conversation. And you saw ads, uh, TV commercials, you saw newspaper ads, you saw mailer, mailers that went out by various individuals at the local level basically saying that Muslims are coming to take this country over, they want to implement Sharia, and that's part of a larger grand strategy to uh, somehow subvert the Constitution and take America over. And so this idea of anti-Muslim rhetoric and national security were brought together and it was used as a political force at local elections and fed federal elections as well. Then we saw in 2008 the idea of the otherizations of Muslims at a very national level. Uh, with, you know, with folks calling Obama a Muslim, uh, for the conversation around Sharia starting at that point. Um, and so the otherization became very intense. And, uh, and, the, and those who really 
wanted to use a political agenda against Obama started to say that he was a Muslim and that he had Muslim tendencies or that he went to a madrasa. And so we, we, this conversation became very mainstream for a while until 18% you know, of, the, of the Republican Party at one point during that election believed that he was a Muslim. Then we continue on after that in 2000, and, and you see this correlation with the elections, national elections taking place. 2006, 2008, and then 2010 again. We saw the Park 51 controversy, the Quran burning controversy that took place. Again, this authorization of the American Muslim community, the fact that they wanted to build a ground zero victory mosque, and, and that, uh, that conversation becoming national to an extent where the president had to weigh in and then even retract to a certain, to a certain extent. So that authorization continued, that political, uh, politicization of the American Muslim community um, and, and use, basically using it as a political football continued. And then of course recently we've seen Michelle Bachman and this whole idea that, that somehow American Muslims at the highest levels of service, of, of public service, are infiltrating the government to somehow subvert it from within. And, you know, and, it, and this time it didn't stop at American Muslim institutions, which has been quite accepted in Washington to a certain extent, and even the news media over the past 10 years. But it went to people who at, at very high levels, people like Huma Abdeen, uh, Congressman Keith Ellison, other folks who were accused of, of somehow infiltrating uh, the, the government and wanting to subvert the, the government from within. And, and so these innuendos kind of were, were thrown out there and, um, and, you know, and, peop and it, it sticks. So what the strategy is, and part of, part of this industry that has been created over the past 10 years, it's been an industry, and I think uh, many, of know, many of you know about the Fear Inc. report that came out of the Center, Center for American Progress, which is a great report which, which tracks this industry that has been created, this very lucrative, uh, financially lucrative industry that has been developed. And, and so this industry has basically, its strategy is, is simple. You make as ridiculous as accusations as possible, and you throw it out, and it'll stick somewhere. Because, because the politics are really difficult right now, people don't want to take risk, and, peop and politicians don't have the political will and mandate to come out and address these issues at a very public level. So that's uh, been uh, what's that. This has been kind of the the stage and and, and the context of the political uh, and and uh, the political violence really that we see over the past few weeks. And uh, so I, I also wanted to address the issue of the American Muslim response. Um, the American Muslim response to this craziness, and I'll get into um, uh, to some of the instances that have taken place, is twofold. Um, you know, after the the, the shooting at the Gurdwara. Um, we saw another 10 hate crimes and hate incidents that took place all over the country. So, I mean, the list is there from, uh, you know, vandalization of, uh, of, of mosques, of graveyards, uh, to throwing of pig feet into mosques, to uh, paintball attacks on mosques. Um, uh, you know, all of this took, took place over a two to three week period. And what was interesting in this correlation between political rhetoric and violence that we kind of, uh, and hate crimes that we need to um, take into consideration is about two weeks ago, or about three weeks ago now, Representative Joe Walsh of Illinois, he in a town hall meeting made a statement that was quite interesting. He said, Muslims are out to kill Americans every single week. And right after this, within a two week period, you had three hate crimes that took place within his district or close to his district. That correlation of political rhetoric and hate crimes is very real. And the American Muslim community sees this, and we've been, they've seen this over the past you know, decade now. Um, and I'll go into why it's important to counter this political rhetoric a little bit later into, uh, at the public level, because if you don't, it, it, it allows for kind of fermenting of ideas and, and craziness to get to the mainstream. The American Muslim response has been twofold. The first, and it's really been a, a generational divide to a certain extent. A lot of these attacks have taken place in, in, in very uh, rural areas, places where people are not familiar with Muslims, they don't have Muslim neighbors, they're not engaged with the American Muslim community, yet there is a presence of the American Muslim community in these areas, places like Mobile, Alabama, you know, in the, in the Midwest, you know, after Katrina when I was in Mobile, Alabama, I saw in this very small town, um, 20 Pakistani American physicians who had stayed in one house and had not left uh, when the hurricane hit, but stayed to take care of the people 
who had been affected and impacted by the hurricane. Now, these individuals, they, they were not known to be Muslim prior to 9-11. You know, they were folks who were, you know, immigrants who would come into to the country, uh, but their identity was not bar marked by the fact that they were Muslim. Now, in the past few years, their identity has been marked. These people are Muslim. So these individuals are, we're getting calls, and we've gotten reports where these individuals now have been impacted. Their practices have been impacted. I mean, their medical practices have been impacted. Uh, the bullying in schools at these, in these uh, counties and these cities have increased, have been on the increase. Uh, you see these individuals who are now, never were asked, you know, what was your faith, what is your ethnicity, are now being asked by their patients, by, by professionals who work with them, what their background is and what their faith is. So they're seeing this at a very real level, at the local level as well. And, and so they're, they're, you know, they're frightened. There's a lot of um, apprehension. Uh, there are folks who are thinking about moving. You know, I just spoke to a physician who, was, uh, who had a practice in Indiana, in a small town in Indiana. He's moving to Los Angeles. He says, I can't, I can't stay in practice here. It's just my, I've got two daughters. They're growing up, and they're not able to go to school, so I'm going to have to move to Los Angeles. He's moving his practice now over to Los Angeles. So that's happening at the local level. But what's interesting is this, there's another generation, the second and third generation of American Muslims are saying, the hell with the Bachmans, the hell with these crazies, the Gaffneys and the crazies out there. We're getting involved and engaged in the civic process. So in a place like Washington, D.C., about six years ago, you probably had only two civic and public policy leadership programs. Now you have at least 10 of these programs that are focused on bringing young American Muslims and minorities to Washington to engage in the public policy discourse, to find jobs, to find internships. And these young people don't want to stay back and stay home and see their identity be marked by this conversation. So you see this kind of dual approach response where you have a first generation of folks who are, who are a bit worried, who are scared, because they've built their lives in these very small communities and have been serving. But then you've got a second generation, a third generation who are saying, we're not going to take this. We're going to actually engage in, in the conversation and make sure that we push back. So that's been a, a, a bit of a, uh, the, the type of response that we've seen in the American Muslim community. But there's also been a sense of puzzlement from the American Muslim community in terms of political and religious leadership at the national level. They don't see the politicos, uh, the politicians, the public figures coming out the way they, they need to come out to counter this political extremism that's taking place, that's being mainstreamed. I mean, Michelle Bachman, that story went on for about two months and didn't get picked up by the media, really, and didn't get picked up by the politicians until Keith Ellison had to make it an issue and move it to the forefront of the conversation in the media and get on to Anderson Cooper. When Anderson Cooper picked it up, that's when people like McCain came out, Boehner came out, Ed Rollins came out. So you don't see this very real political will um, that from public officials. Uh, on this issue. And, and, and the problem with that is if you don't see this political will and uh, public commentary against this type of rhetoric, as we said, it ferments. And then that, that turns into hate crimes, that turns into conversations that become ugly. You know, what's interesting is that the Southern Poverty Law Center, Mark Potak was telling me the other day that um, right after 9-11, there was a spike and hate crimes against those who are perceived to be American Muslims. And a lot of times, it's not even American Muslims, it's just those who are perceived to be American Muslims. And they saw um, a spike in hate crimes that took place, and acts of violence that took place. But when President Bush came out, he went to a mosque. He actually, for a whole, maybe about, it was about half a year, about six months, he repeated this conversation that American Muslims are part of the, part of the uh, you know, uh, democratic framework of this country, and they're part, they were Americans, and just as, um, as American as any other group. That worked, because what, the, what Mark told me was that there was a 1,600% decrease the next year in hate crimes. I mean, that's a huge number. And they correlate that to the fact that a lot of you know, folks were, uh, were listening to President Bush and to senior level administration folks saying that this is not the fault of, of, of any specific community. And so it's extremely important when you have people like Colin Powell in 2008, when the conversation around Obama being Muslim and a Muslim president took place, it was Colin Powell who came out, who kind of, you know, calmed the situation down and said, so what? So what if we have a Muslim in the White House? 
So what if there's a Muslim kid who wants to be a president? When that conversation took place publicly, you saw a certain level, even in the media and in the public discourse, a calming of oh, the, the Muslim scares or, or the Muslim scare or the Muslims are coming out to get us. So this type of political will and leadership is extremely important to ensure that this rhetoric does not ferment, that this rhetoric does not take hold in the mainstream, because that industry that has been created after 9-11, these guys and gals, are, they've got influence. I mean, uh, you know, in 2008, about five or six of our neighbors uh, came, to, uh, came to my wife and I and asked us questions about this film called Obsession. Um, and in 2000, there was, a, there was a film called Obsession that was, um, uh, that was made basically looking at Islam, the radical threat of Islam um, uh, on the West. And in key swing states, Ohio, Virginia, um, Virginia, uh, uh, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, you had about 10 million copies of this DVD that was just mailed to people randomly. And they would get it in their mail, they would get it in their newspaper. So I had about three or five neighbors approach it and say, what, what is this? This is crazy. And we live in, nor we live in Northern Virginia. And, but they had access to a Muslim. They could come to me, and I knew the issue, and I knew the film, and we were working on it. But imagine all those folks in North Carolina, in Ohio, in Virginia, in Pennsylvania, who received these DVDs but were not able to talk to anyone. And so this industry has been working very hard on the ground with faith communities, with, with senior citizens, with, so many, with rotary clubs to ensure that their message of hate gets across. And when you, when you don't get that political leadership and will at the national level, this issue ferments and it creates this very real sense of hate that's, that, that, that's created at the local level. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for questions. Um, what I'll ask is, uh, first of all, we follow the Jeopardy rule. Your question has to be in the form of a question. Um, if you can't put a question mark at the end of it, it's not a question. Um, and uh, secondly, if you do have a question, just please let us know if it's addressed to someone specific on the panel or to the panel generally. Um, and you can just raise your hands. I'll, I'll call on you. Um, yeah, right here. Uh, David Eisenberg, uh, two oh, we have a mic, actually. Make it a little bit easier. Uh, David Eisenberg, uh, two questions, if I might. Mr. Ackerman, since you mentioned the Department of Homeland Security report that came out a couple years ago, uh, which was widely poo-pooed, uh, to your knowledge, uh, is anybody in government um, going to revisit the thesis of that report and say, well, yeah, maybe this is something we should actually look into? Will DHS or FBI or any other law enforcement intel community do that? Will Congressman King now hold a series of hearings on the subject? Because he, as I recall, he was previously asked to when he was holding his last series of hearings, he said, no, no, we don't need to. To the other panelists, I would, I would ask, have you considered the possibility that in part what we're seeing here is simply the fear of a previously uh, relatively secure elite top of society segment looking at America, seeing the future, seeing it's no longer going to be predominantly white and Christian and, and saying that scares us and we're going to lash out against those who are not like us. Uh, on the on the white supremacy neo Nazi question, um, I would imagine you would see uh, discrete studies uh, inside agencies uh, about this. Maybe some some resources devoted to the subject, but nothing on the order of reorienting um, the considerable surveillance resources of of the United States government uh, toward it. Um, it's been hard enough just to get basic information about how uh, the FBI breaks down its counterterrorism budget to a, a, a lot funding and a lot manpower um, toward the threat of, of, uh, of Islamic extremism versus uh, dom in domestic terrorism in um, uh, neo-Nazi white supremacist movements. So I, I wouldn't hold my breath on that. Uh, j just briefly on that, I, I won't even uh, attempt to, to say that I understand the, the workings of that strategy sort of at the upper levels of, of that conservative philosophy. But uh, I think the sense, I think, uh, as, as Horace you know, spoke to, I think, very well, the, the rhetoric coming from high-level politicians is leading to responses at a, a very localized level because those actions at the local level are being validated. So a politician attacks the Muslim community or, or claims that uh, that otherness is a threat to national security or to the fabric of America, that gives 
the attacker in Oak Creek or the, the attacker of the mosques or, or anyone who's uh, committed a, a hate crime justification for their acts. And, and it doesn't just result in, in the, the you know, mass killings or, or um, the uh, incident that occurred in Oak Creek. It's at the, the level of, of kids being bullied in schools. Uh, a parent who holds a belief that doesn't correct their child and, and you have a, a sick child in, in New Jersey whose turban was set on fire by a classmate. Um, you, you have uh, a kid who was br brutally beaten in, in the bathroom because he wears a turban because he's different, um, told by his, his fellow student that, uh, that he doesn't belong in this country, even though he's born in, and raised in New Jersey. Um, so. Uh, whether there's a, a broad conspiracy on, on the fact that, that uh, ultimately th there is a, a increase in minority communities becoming the majority in the next 20 years, um, and this is a response to that threat, or if it is a legitimate belief that there is a threat against a national security, which is misguided in the context of saying the threat is the Muslim community or the threat is, is this otherness, um, that, that I, I, I can't speak to that, but, but certainly there is, is no question that there is a correlation between the rhetoric at the, the highest levels, both in, in politics and in, in media, and what's happening um, at the, the human level um, throughout, throughout America. I think um, there's no question that the, the demographic shift and the change that we're going through as a nation is part of the equation here. And I think as President Bill Clinton says, so eloquently, uh, you know, as, as this country changes, as the demographics change, our biggest challenge as a country will be going through that shift. And by 2050, when that change takes place, um, we're, going to, we're going to definitely be tested as a nation. But this is where political will and political leadership comes into play. Um, as President Clinton says, either you can have um, a political elite, you can have a leadership that is willing to engage the conversa conversation in a way that's constructive. So of course there's demographic shifts. There's age demographic, demographic shifts, there's ethnic shifts, there's religious shifts. But there's folks, whether they're conservative or liberal, who can take advantage of that and engage those communities, engage those ethnic minorities or religious minorities, and make sure that they become part of their platform as a party, as a constituency, as whatever it may be. Or you can use political re rhetoric to try to rile people up and gain some maybe votes in the short term, but lose communities in the long term. And I think that's why political leadership is so important. And we don't talk about that political leadership enough. If someone, if people fear that there will be a shift in the demographics and in, in the way our society looks or, or acts even, then we need to be able to have that conversation constructively, but that needs to be led by our political leaders. Yeah, in the back. Um, this question, I think, well, it's for all of you, but um, given your comments, Horace, I'd be interested in, in hearing what you think in particular um, about this question of um, uh, political leaders speaking out. So as you rightly pointed out, after 9-11, President Bush took to the stage and made it very clear that American Muslims were a part of the American family. And then you had uh, Colin Powell and Michael Chertoff at DHS uh, and many other uh, members of the Republican Party. Um, you know, obviously now many things have changed, but to what extent do you think that Democratic leaders, I, I mean, if you're gonna look at the Republicans versus the Democrats, who do you think can not only be viable but also effective in um, carrying forth a similar kind of message? Um, I know there's been some research done in terms of what audiences you target with more um, sort of pro-Muslim, pro-Islam messages. Um, and so do you think, in your, in your view, is it, do you try to go after those members of the conservative, sort of uh, uh, people with more conservative views who might be more amenable or, or, or more reachable with these views, or would you focus more on sort of a liberal audience? Well, you know, I, I think we have to look at this. It's easy and it's very, um, tempting to look at this from a liberal or conservative prism and, and kind of then fall into that trap and reinforce our, um, uh, our biases. And I think a lot of people unfortunately do that, right? You, 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 you have a certain political view and you, you look at every issue that comes into the public sphere through that, that lens. What I would say is that we need to go after everyone. 
we need validators. And the research so shows that we need validators. We need national security validators. So when Secretary Chertoff came out, came out and said what he said about American Muslims, he had a constituency that he was talking to. It was a national security constituency. It was a very specific group of people. And he was trying to bring them along. When Colin Powell came out, he had a constituency, he had people who listened to him, and those people come out. So we need everyone. When John McCain came out against, uh, against the accusations that Bachman made, he had a specific constituency, and that constituency will follow him. So that's why I think we have to go through, we have to have a broad set of individuals, party affiliations, um, you know, political leanings come out and engage the conversation. Um, in a way that's responsible. If we just have the liberals come out, it'll become a partisan issue. And unfortunately, if it becomes a partisan issue, people will dig in and not say anything. So that was, that's why it was encouraging when Boehner came out, uh, Speaker Boehner came out uh, against Bachman and said that what she, you know, the accusations she made were very dangerous. Uh, when Ed Rollins, her former uh, chairman of her campaign, a presidential run, came out and said that was, it, was, it was completely ridiculous. And, and talked about where he sees the Republican Party going if this continues, a party that's very sp for, for a very specific group of individuals. And so what I th our strategy has, has to be that we need to reach out to everyone, to Republicans, to Democrats, to Libertarians, to whoever it may be, and ensure they become part of the process. Because we, we don't want it to become a partisan issue. At least that's how we view it. Yeah, I, just very quickly I'll add to that. I, I think that there there's sort of this general assumption that, that minority rights, religious rights, is a Democratic, you know, de Democratic Party issue, and, and Republicans are against that. And I, that's just that's that's not true. Um, it, but there's always, uh, with every legislative or advocacy effort, uh, a, sh a concerted effort to get as much bipartisan support as possible, because ultimately the the voice of uh, a moderate or, or conservative Republican in support of an issue of importance to the Sikh community or, or to any of the minority communities uh, at issue today is far more powerful. Um, you obviously, you know, to beat, beat a dead horse, the comments of Colin Powell, the comments of George W. Bush went far further than uh, the comments of a, a liberal member of Congress um, would have had after 9-11 or, or in 2008 with President Obama. Um, so. With every effort, um, there is a, a direct um, level of outreach to to all members of of, um, of Congress um, and and all parties to get that bipartisan support. It doesn't always happen, um, but when it does, it, it's far more effective. I can tell you, with the the armed services um, work we've done on on accommodation of sick Americans. Um, and there also have been Muslim Americans who've been accommodated um, with regard to facial hair. Um, the support of Republican members of Congress has been instrumental in convincing DOD that this is not uh, a liberal fringe issue. This is an issue of, it's an American issue. Uh, minority rights, religious rights, are, it's, it's an American issue that should be considered respected and, and uh, addressed by both parties. Uh, this is somewhat out of my lane, but I just very quickly like to, add, like to note that um, perhaps the most uh, vocal element of American society, particularly from from uh, from respected leaders, um, to have made uh, statements uh, praising Muslims and 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 showing respect to Islam has been from the American military. Uh, think about you know comments made by General Petraeus, by General McChrystal, by General Allen, um, and I don't have any data to back this up, but my strong suspicion from uh, covering the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, from going there for, for on, on several occasions, is that were you to poll uh, this country, the most Islamophilic cohort would be combat veterans between the age of 25 and 35. All for the very good reason that uh, most Americans tend not to travel abroad and spend a lot of time immersed in other cultures and have some of our presumptions about other cultures challenged by that frontline experience. And it's the military that's been called upon to do that. And also because in order for the military to do its job in these countries, they've had no choice but to partner uh, with locals and get to know them and live by them and, and come to respect them. I think to this point, I have an anecdote that's really interesting. I mean, because this is a very important point that Spencer makes. Um, on a Sunday morning, we're at home, and I got a, I got a call from um, a local candidate in Virginia running for Congress. And he's running against my member of Congress, and so he's a Republican. And he, um, so he says, you know, his, his uh, the person who was calling uh, on his behalf says, we'd like your vote. 
So, you know, I was thinking, do I really want to get into this conversation on a Sunday morning when I'm with my family? Um, so I kind of look at my wife and said, I, let, me, let me take this call. So, you know, I, I engage this individual and I say, well, you know, my parents were Republicans. Uh, my parents were Republicans. They probably voted for Bush and, and they, you know, they loved Reagan. I mean, my, all I heard at home was, was how great Reagan was because my parents are Afghan Americans and what Reagan did in Afghanistan was just, that's all, all praise of Bush and Reagan. That's all I heard growing up. And, and so he said, what changed? Uh, as he said, why, you know, are, are you voting for, uh, or will you vote for this? And I said, I don't know. I, I, you know, I haven't made up my mind, but, but this conversation around American Muslims and minorities and this community, it really, I mean, it disturbs me. It's, it's something that I, that I find disturbing. I've got children, and I don't want my children to hear this conversation at the public level. And I think some of that is coming from um, you know, uh, Republican members of Congress, or and uh, so he, he, you know, what he tells me he goes, well, this individual was a veteran. He served in Iraq and he served in Afghanistan, and he doesn't hold those views because he was able to engage Muslims in the front lines. And so I ask you to reconsider your vote because this individual will be willing to engage you. And so what what he did was he took my number and had the candidate call me, and say, listen. These are not my views. You know, I'd like you to please reconsider your vote. And so I think that point is extremely important. We need to be able to get individuals like that to, to have this conversation publicly. There's a woman in the back in the tan jacket. Hi, uh, Pam Constable from the Washington Post. Um, I wanted to play a little bit um, devil's advocate, um, Horace, um, talking about the hate industry. Um, you know, I, I think this rhetoric of hate, it, it, it doesn't come from nowhere. You know, it's not being made up of whole cloth. This is a brief comment and then a question. You know, I've lived a lot in the Muslim world. Um, there, is, there is something going on. I mean, there is, I don't know what you want to call it, a sort of an, uh, an Islamic revival, a sort of a, you know, not sort of a muscular Islamic revival going on across the Muslim world. Um, you also, at the same time, are seeing really scary things happening. Look at Mali, for example. Look at Niger. I mean, look what's happening out there. People see this. People read about it. People who already have a proclivity to fear and, and not understand what's going on, they're scared to death. So here's my question. Do you think that the Muslim American community is doing enough to counter this not unreasonable fear? And it's not just Representative King. It's not just people trying to grandstand. I think people are genuinely very worried about what's going on uh, in the Muslim world. And they see it as a very scary thing. And, and I'm, obviously, so do most Muslims. So do 99% of the Muslims in the world. So again, my question is, do you think that the American Muslim community is doing enough to make it clear that 99.9 percent .9 of you <laughs> do not believe in this stuff. Um, and I was thinking about that television show. I never saw it. I forgot the name of it. It was trying to portray ordinary Muslim life in Dearborn or some ordinary Muslim place. Oh, uh, and was there was some sponsor that canceled because they said it, they were making them look too normal. I don't remember. I wasn't here at the time, but I thought, what is this? I mean. I never saw it, but it seemed to me that that was a good idea to portray a normal, ordinary Muslim family in Dearborn having all its, you know, personal arguments and whatever about life. Um, and I thought there should be more of it. Again, I never saw it, but I wonder, is more of that being done? And, and what is being done? Um, that's my question. Uh, good, good question. Uh, on, on, on the first point, I completely agree. I think there is there's very problematic things going on in, in, that, in a certain part of the world that needs to be addressed. Um, just this recent incident of, of this little Pakistani girl who was accused of burning the Quran and was arrested. I mean, our, our, just today we released a statement, our organization released a statement calling this absurd. We asked you know, American Muslims to call the Pakistani embassy to make sure that this, uh, that this was uh, not something that was, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's not humane. And, and there, there, there are problems. There's definitely extremism. There's definitely um, uh, radical people out there, like in Mali, uh, like in Afghanistan. I mean, I come from, uh, my parents come from Afghanistan, and, we, and we've seen this, and we've seen the craziness that's out there. Um, and American Muslims are doing a lot to differentiate their understanding of their faith, not just American Muslims, Muslims in general, their understanding of faith and the very minority that engages in this political, po uh, like political craziness and, and, and um, and, and really 
has a very political agenda, but uses a religious garb to then hide their political agenda under. So that, that's the key. But here's the problem. I think, you know, for the past 10 years, Muslim, American Muslims have been shouting and screaming that this is not who we are. This is not us. This is not what we stand for. And we've been doing this, I don't know, every single means that we've had, press releases, press conferences, you know, demonstrations, I mean, everything that we've done as a community to really highlight this, a lot of times, unfortunately, that doesn't get down to the, to the local level, to the local communities. It's not sexy, so it's not covered as much in the media. When you're denouncing something, it's not as sexy as somebody burning a copy of the Quran or actually desecrating uh, a, a, a Buddha or a symbol in Mali. That's, that's part of the problem. But here's the issue, just as you mentioned, I mean, you brought up the uh, excellent example of all American Muslim. So what does, you know, all American Muslim basically portrayed American life, not even Muslim life, American life in Dearborn, Michigan. You had somebody who was looking to buy a disco cl a club and trying to, you know, find, uh, uh, open a hookah bar. You had someone else who was just a cop trying to, you know, uh, make a living. Yet for the Islamophobic industry, that went too far in humanizing American Muslims. That's the, that's the problem. It's not that we shouldn't talk about extremism and we shouldn't talk about the crazies out there. Let's talk about the crazies out there. Let's d differentiate who the crazies are and who the crazies are not. And let's talk about people who want to implement uh, a medieval version of Sharia law. Let's talk about that. We have no issue in talking about that. But let's not conflate American Muslims, their beliefs, their traditions, with the craziness that's out there. So when you have this industry, that is functioning based off of fear. It's very lucrative, it's over $50 million. And when they get Lowe's to take their sponsorship off of a, of a very benign and even probably horribly done uh, you know, a reality TV uh, uh, show, that's where the conflation becomes a problem. Where average American Muslims are trying to live their lives, but they're called extremists, because they want to open a, a, a bar I'm an extremist somehow. I'm subverting the American tradition of alcoholism. I, I, that, that's where the craziness comes in, and that's where we need to question. So that's part of the, the conflation that this industry does, and it's, it's purposely done. It's not just done out of, out, of, uh, out of ignorance. It's purposely done so that the average American who doesn't have that engagement with Muslims then fears Sharia. Like I had a, I had a friend uh, who's a pastor, um, a progressive pastor in, in, in Wisconsin. He said his congregation is going through bankruptcy. So they've been trying to hold workshops on how to, you know, how to go through foreclosures and bankruptcies and get help with their homes and home loans. And he said, yet his, his congregation is coming to him and talking about the, 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 the fear of Sharia law in, in, in Wisconsin. And, and you know, you know that's, that's not what, what a pastor is, is, is trained to, to deal with. But they're it's very specific. They're very deliberate in getting to these communities that don't engage American Muslims. Can I jump in on this real quick? Sure. Uh, why should American Muslims have to answer for psychopaths in Mali? Uh, I'm Jewish. Um, and it occurs to me that uh, a, a couple days ago, uh, a Jewish lynch mob went through Jerusalem and brutalized Palestinian civilians, uh, their neighbors, their, you know, people they probably, uh, you know, saw every day. And when I hear a question like that, even with the gracious answer that, that we all just heard, I have to really think how privileged I am that I live in a country that doesn't ask me to answer for the crimes of people who say that they're my co-religionists. And I wish that we had more of that sense in our country. Well, and, I, and I would just add to that that we, you know, it's probably restating the obvious to this audience, but we don't ask that question of every white Christian American after Oak Creek or after Oklahoma City. But we ask that question every time something happens in the Muslim community. Um, so that, that, that's the problem. Um, this gentleman right here in the front. Yeah, um, you have mentioned a few incidents, uh, the burning of mosque in Missouri just a day before the Oak Creek incident, although thankfully uh, there were no casualties there. Uh, I suppose didn't receive uh, that much of media attention uh, and even the people in the administration here were not aware of the incident. So what do you think is the reason for that? Uh, do the Muslim organizations don't 
r reach out to the administration and the law enforcement? Or uh, you think there is a kind of indifference when uh, these incidents happen uh, in mosques and are targeted towards Muslim communities? Are you, are you addressing anyone specific on the panel? Uh, if anyone is willing to answer. Um, I think there's, uh, th there are multiple reasons. I, I think there is a general sense of indifference. You know, what really kind of, um, at a very personal level now, what, what impacted me after the, the shootings in Wisconsin was um, not only that, you know, I, I first, uh, you know, I had a conversation with my children. I've got a 10 and a 12 year old about this, right? So they talked about, you know, and they know the difference between uh, Sikhs and Muslims, and they've got friends who are uh, of Sikh background in school. And so, you know, one of them asked me, why, why did they shoot someone who's a Sikh? So, you know, and, and I, my, my stomach just churned. I was like, you know, I think they mistook, mistook them from, for being Muslim. That's, that's the very, like, raw conversation that people have been having with their children, with neighbors. Um, but part of, you know, wh what was difficult was that when, when people were having the conversation around the shooting, it was not that the shooting was the problem itself. Hand, you know, hands down, that's it. The shooting was the problem, regardless of who was targeted or if there was, it was a mistake of a mistaken identity or whatever it was. What c certain people started to say, well, you know, they mistook them for Muslims. You know, he mistook the, that for a mosque. And there's this insinuation that if it had happened maybe to a Muslim, that it wouldn't have been as severe as an issue. And I think there was a lot of, you know, uh, there was a few articles that were written by Sikh Americans that kind of addressed that and said, this is crazy that this insinuation is made. But there is this indifference. And, and, and I think because there's been this, po the political rhetoric, the industry that has been built over the 10 years, past 10 years, people see Muslims as a legitimate threat. And so when something happens, people are like, well, you know, there must be a reason why people are, are acting out against American Muslims. And so there is that level of indi uh, indifference that, that, that takes place. But then at the same time, there's been a, a level of support of neighbors, of communities. You know, I, I just had an evangelical friend who just emailed me yesterday. There is the evangelical community, a local uh, a group of evangelical leaders have, uh, have bought a bunch of ad space in local communities saying, I stand with my Muslim neighbor. I stand with my sick neighbor. So there is an, there's also a, a show of support that's coming from various communities. Um, and I think that's the greatness of America, right? That, that's the greatness of our democracy, of our pluralism. And that's what, we need, that's what we need to kind of promote. And that's what our leaders can promote if they had the political will. And if leaders promote it, if leaders come out and say it, that this is not okay, that this is not something that's acceptable, then people will generally tend to change their opinions. So a question all the way in the back. Just to follow up on that, and I appreciate the fact that communities stand with one another. Uh, a concern, of course, again, is the violence overseas that happens to, you know, between different Muslim groups, but also to Christian groups and other religious minorities. I wonder if the American Muslim community could have a platform in general to stand up for the groups overseas that are minorities because they face the same uh, experience in reverse. And I think if the community could make that statement and continue to make that statement, I think it's been made at times, I assume, uh, it would really empower the community because it would make it into more of a universal issue. Uh, Ambassador um, Ibrahim Rasul was here, I believe, in April or May at Georgetown, and he made the same point. And he said that uh, not just standing up for rights of Muslims in America, but American Muslims need to stand up for the rights of other minorities overseas. And I think we would join with each other much stronger if we could do that. Yeah, no, I agree. I think American Muslim leaders have, have, and institutions have, have been doing this. I just, I just mentioned that, you know, with this case in Pakistan of this, uh, you know, teenage or this little girl who's Christian, I've, I've heard from the whole spectrum of American Muslim leaders coming out and condemning it, and uh, we were going to do a joint statement with our partners in the interfaith community. So you see this 
taking place. And there are American Muslim leaders who just went to Egypt to talk to the, uh, to the new president of Egypt about the rights of minorities and, and, and the rights of uh, Coptic Christians. And there was a letter that was sent by American Muslim leaders to him. Um, there was a letter that was sent to the leadership in Tunisia. So th it's becoming quite vibrant. And I think this conversation can help in bringing communities together because when uh, you know when the folks who took up who bought up all those ad spaces uh, about standing with American Muslims and sick Americans when that happened and then this incident in Pakistan took place uh, we communicated and said we can issue a joint statement saying we stand for religious freedom wherever we are um, but you know I, I complete uh, my American side completely um, kind of uh, Sympathize with what, what Spencer mentioned. I, I don't need to, to, to stand up for people who are not part of what I stand for. But at the same time, unfortunately, we, we, we shoulder that responsibility in the public, and we've got to engage in that conversation. And, and I think American Muslim institutions are doing that now. I can just jump in really quickly, I mean, to the, to the last few questions. Um, one of the challenges here is that American Muslims are Americans. Mm -hmm. um, they just don't know what's going on. Um, you know, I mean, if you ask the average, I mean, do a lot of work with American Muslim communities across the country. If you ask the average American Muslim, even say he or she goes to their prayer space or mosque and they're engaged, they have no idea what's going on in terms of sectarian conflicts, theology. If you ask most American Muslims, are you Sunni or are you Shia? Um, they may be able to answer yes or no on, on that question. And if you ask them a follow-up, they'll have no idea what's going on. Um, they don't, you know, many of them will not know if you quote something from the Quran, whether it's from the Quran or not. I mean, these sort of forms of religious literacy are actually pretty universal. Yeah. Um, you know, there was, a, I think, a poll done in Pakistan um, in the last 10 years that the majority of Pakistanis did not know who that Muhammad was the last prophet. And this is sort of universally seen in Islam as sort of elemental to Muslim identity, right? It's sort of like saying Jesus is the son of God, right? I mean, these are sort of realities, right? So if you ask the average American Muslim, what do you think of what's going on in Pakistan? They don't know. You know, they, they just don't know what's happening. Um, and so I think that needs to be taken into account because many times persons will go into these communities expecting, you know, some sort of opinion or denunciation and they'll get this kind of indifference or confusion, which doesn't come from a bad place. It just comes from the fact that it's outside of their everyday experience. Um, I think we have time for maybe two, two more questions. Maybe we'll take two questions together. Um, I think, Craig, you had a question, and right in front. Oh, maybe not. With all the discussion on this, one of the things that I have not heard and might bring the communities together is the discussion of the roots of terrorism in America, starting with the bombing of the Omaha building, the shootings in Virginia, in the University of Virginia, the assassination of Amish school children and the assassination of the Sikhs. And I've heard the word in this conversation of crazies, 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 but the crazies have to be addressed by the public health sector. And how are you going to make a system where the public health sector is more made aware of patterns of conduct, like buying of fertilizer or buying of a large number of guns suddenly so that it pops up on the radar of the medical professionals that are going to treat these, that have treated these people in the past. That's my question. Can we just take two more and we'll take the questions together and then answer them? Um, there was one right here all the way in the front. Um, and I think you had a question too. Yeah, uh, church and freedom's correspondent, Bessess uh, has uh, have the FBI or uh, law enforcement group so far make apology to the mass community. And their highest leader is the President of the United States have he done this. And I'd like to make a comment. The mass community in the United States is American community. And likewise, the Jewish community here is American community. The Indian community is American community. And the, the Chinese community is uh, American community. This is only different. That is is a unique nature of the United States of Amer American. Thank you. Hi. Um, 
Uh, I'm an independent writer. Um, I just wanted to just follow up on what Horace is saying about, uh, you know, uh, putting this in the the political arena and that the politician should should actually address that. But I also see technology as being um, a, a, a problem to that because most people don't really listen to their politicians as much as they will go on the internet, you know, or someplace like that and get information. So how are we essentially going to address that? Um, on the question about the, the roots of terrorism and public health, uh, since 9-11, we've had uh, a pretty striking case in the discourse about this uh, of saying one thing and meaning another. Uh, we use the term terrorism, the war on terrorism, and, and, and onward to, to identify the thing that the United States is supposedly uh, trying to stop. But at the same time, we've only meant a very specific sub-cohort of terrorism, terrorism by whether one would think that it would be more narrowly defined as the threat of al-Qaeda, but it, it gets sort of broadly conflated to the threat of, 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 other, of other groups like Hamas or Hezbollah or other Islamic extremist organizations. Um, and it's probably better to start insisting uh, that people say specifically what they mean instead of retreating to uh, these very loaded or confusing terms that would probably do a, a good job of helping define what specifically the threats are from what groups in the United States without um, relying on this blanket term. As for the public health thing, um, I, th I think there's, there's, there's. I, I haven't honestly given much thought to the the role of public health here. Um, I would think that if someone is stockpiling weapons or buying a lot of fertilizer, that's a problem for law enforcement more than it is for public health. Um, for the apology question, um, that I've not seen, but uh, the president of the United States, the national security staff, um, and the senior leadership of the FBI, to some degree, um, after it it, it became uh, known that uh, some of this uh, inflammatory stuff, anti-Muslim stuff, was being taught uh, in the FBI and the Department of Justice and the Department of Defense, um, initiated around the federal government's different national security agencies, departments, and branches, a very thoroughgoing review of counterterrorism training to get rid of that stuff. So there is, there is that, um, I guess you might call, silver lining. Just on the last question, because I think the other ones uh, have probably been addressed, but the, you know, the idea that, that knowledge is gained through the Internet, that the resources that are out there are really where, where many folks, particularly young folks, are, are learning um, uh, things t today. I don't think that takes away from the onus on, on politicians to, to speak out and to set the, the tone and set the example, because everything trickles down from that. Um, you know, one of the most interesting things that I find with every um, campaign or, or issue or case that I've been involved in in the last decade is when there is a, a media hit, you go and read the comments. And, you know, you have the, the trollers who are going to go and, and incite some sort of, of conflict on a, a blog anywhere. But you also get a, a good sense of, of what the perspective is of, of the audience. You have individuals who are supportive of whatever the effort is and those that are critical and, and those that are frankly off the map, left or right. Um, but that dialogue, you know, again, it, it's a top-down approach. If, if the President of the United States is speaking out against uh, an attack on the Sikh American community or an attack on, on a, a Muslim mosque or, or post-9-11 attacks on, on uh, these minority communities, that's going to trickle its way down, and then some of the statistics that uh, that Horace spoke to, I think, are are exactly on point. That that if there is an example being set, that's going to set the tone. It's not going to take away the the fringe um, discussion. It's not going to take away someone's resources that that will say that that Muslims are terrorists and Muslims should be hated, or or anyone wearing a turban is associated with with Al Qaeda. But uh, it at least sets the example that, that hopefully um, creates uh, an environment of resources that are that are accurate. Uh, you know, I, th I think technology is difficult. I mean, it's difficult to deal with, uh, as you mentioned. Um, right after Bachman, kind of the Bachman controversy came out in the open, uh, through her email fundraising campaign, she raised um, and her. Uh, it was mostly email and some a mail-in campaign, she raised over a million dollars in one week. Um, she, and using basically attacks that people had made against her, whether it was 
so the internet and the proliferation of hate speech on the internet and the fact the internet has allowed this to flow openly and um, you know an anecdote of that is my my godfather is a 90 year old Jewish white man and uh, you know I randomly get emails from from him uh, and uh, usually the e emails are very very problematic and they're usually point comic sans Sorry? In 32 point comic sans. Right, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and they're usually about how Muslims are out to get us, and you know, the, the sent to the Rotary Clubs, it's then sent to the you know, book clubs that, that him and uh, uh, my godmother are part of. And so I get these emails, and they're like, well, how do we respond to this? And, and so they've got me as a resource to go to, and it all, mostly it comes through like these mass chained emails that everybody forwards. Um, so it's difficult to stay on top of that. It's really, if I, I can send them a response, and, but that response is not gonna gain the same type of momentum that the actual email gained. And so it's, uh, it's uh, may, maybe you know, Mike German and some of these folks who follow this online can, can talk to how, how, you can, how we can address this online, because it is a big issue online. I mean, this, this stuff is proliferating at a fast pace online. Well, cool. thank you very much for coming out. Um, really appreciate it, and uh, some great questions, great discussion. Um, I believe I know uh, Spencer and Horace are on Twitter as well. Um, I don't know if you're. I, I am not on Twitter. He will so be, he will be on Twitter soon. Um, so thank you very much. Have a great afternoon. Thanks so much.